Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at cokerministries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. Now, just real quick, uh, if you hadn't signed up, I'm sure most of you, that if you're going, you've already signed up. Uh, the paper's out in the kitchen uh, for the camp coming up. And uh, all, all we need to know is the number of, the number of people to prepare food for. I, I'd hate to cook two briskets and only really need one, because then people would just have to eat more. You know, I'd hate that. And uh, don't forget, two weeks after the camp, we have a meeting here. Uh, it's a second coming celebration. It's not going to be a theological debate on rapture practice, whether it's pre, mid, post, pre-wrath, if there's any or not. It's a, we all agree that there's a second coming of the Lord. That's Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. And we're going to be excited about whenever He comes and then whichever way He comes, because we know we're getting close. Amen. Getting close. All right, Father, we thank this opportunity you give us to gather together in this place. We worship you. We thank you. We surrender to you. We desire that Jesus be our rabbi. And Jesus, you sent the Holy Spirit to teach us all truth. So we surrender our information to you, Holy Spirit. We ask that you take the information we have, and if it's not supposed to be there, pluck it out. We, we release our ego from our information. We allow it to be removed without it bringing pain to us. And we ask that truth set us free. May your truth reign, as, reign supreme in us, not information. May transformation be what we're about, not change. Transformation. The power, your power working on the inside of us to bring change on the outside of us. So the world may know that we are one with you and you are one with us. All God's people said, Amen. 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 Turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4. Oh my goodness. Verse 4. You lost your notes? No. <laughs> hey Bob, before you get any further, can you open that door? Go to the dining room table. There's a bag of books. Inside the bag of books, Behind one book is a pair of glasses. Oh. Oh. Captain Four Eyes. <laughs> Mr. Whipple. Otherwise, we're all going to end up in a pit. Yeah, talking about heresy. <laughs> I'll read the way it looks. I think I'm in Romans. No. That's, well, that's where we ended that's where last we week, like Romans. Four, four verse three. Well, we're, After we're, three weeks. Well, the first two weeks was introduction. I told you. Uh, yeah. I warned you the first uh, was going to be a long introduction. I didn't say how long. Yeah, you did say. Didn't I? Thank we you. skipped Thank the second you. week. Though. I'm a witness. <laughs> when I say introduction, I mean introduction. There was just so much in there, I couldn't bypass it. And actually, we're getting to the part that... Thank you. Did you go lick on them and clean them? Yeah. Well, uh, whoo, whoo. Hallelujah. Verse 1. Verse 1. What then shall we say 
that Abraham, I, I love, in my notes, I put it right there. I, I've got above Abraham, I have not Moses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you have to flip the coin. You know, it's we read what the Bible is saying, but in what it is saying, there's also what it's not saying that it's saying. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. In this case, it says, <laughs> what then shall we say? That Abraham, not Moses, our father. Now, I think this is so cool. This is what we're going to try to focus on tonight. Who's he speaking to? Who is the Apostle Paul writing this book to? Remember how it starts in Romans chapter 1, verse 7. The Italians. To the Italians, thank you, Dan. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. That's who this book is written to. So it is written to Gentiles who have been saved. It is written to Jews that have been saved and they have been converted out of Judaism into Christianity. And there were those that were Jews trying to convert people back into Judaism. But he's speaking to those that are beloved of God, called to be saints. Right? And I don't know about you, but there, there was a period of time in my life when, when I just assumed a lot of things. And I think that's one of the problems we have in church, don't spell it how you wish, is that we just assume things. We don't think things through. Yes, that was on Facebook Live. I <laughs> we don't think about things. We just, you know, I always thought Abraham was a Jew. Ooh, got quiet as Holy Ghost Pentecostal charismatic tongue talking faith in the Catholic Church. <laughs> wow. Well, Abraham was, but Abram wasn't. Okay. Jews didn't always exist. I thought Adam was a Jew at one time. Moses was a Jew. No, they had a start. And Abram wasn't a Jew. The Jews weren't around when Abram was Abram. Abram became Matter of fact, what I want you to see tonight is something so spectacular. If you've never seen it before, and that's exactly what chapter 4 is talking about, is what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to tell you what it says before we read it. And you're going to say, that's crazy. Then I'm going to read it, and you're going, oops, there it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> oops, there it is. And it's exactly what chapter 4 is talking about. You know, we are just so pro the poor, not the poor fellow. It was so fun on on Saturday night. Faith without works is righteousness. righteousness. Yes. See, see, that's good. You're getting it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, because we're so we're so programmed to say faith without works is dead. That's only one place in Scripture. There's three places where it says it's righteousness and justification that leads to reconciliation. I mean, whoa. One fellow this, this Saturday, I, I did that to him, and he all said, they were dead. And, and, and I said, well, it says, so say, say it right with me. Faith about works is, and he said, dead. And he went, you know, like that again, everybody else said righteousness. And we did it again. Every time we did it, he had... He was so trained to say dead. Exactly he was right. just couldn't get, he was hit. Oh, huh. It was just pre, it was programmed in his heart, in his mind, in his psyche to repeat it that way. Even at the end, I did it one more time at the end and everybody said righteousness and he said, oh, and everybody's cracked up laughing because he was trying to say it according to the scripture we read. You know, we're just so pre-programmed to think a certain way. But I like the Bible telling us what the Bible says. You know, that, that's, that's how I want to be. I, I really don't want to be programmed. I want to understand. You know, you know, you can, how can I, does anybody know what a mathematical equation is? Yep. <laughs> two plus two equals four. Well, that's, the, that, that's where I left off. Okay, that's where I stopped. There, there, there's bigger ones later on as you go on in schooling, but but if you know the equation, you can work anything. But, but that doesn't make you a mathematician. 
A mathematician understands the equation. A mathematician doesn't have to go, well, to, uh, to. A mathematician understands how math works. They, they see it, they feel it, they, it's part of them. A carpenter, anybody can hammer, well, Joy can <laughs> hammer a nail, okay, with a hammer. And I said that on public, you break a listen. You know, most people can hammer a nail with a hammer. That doesn't make them a carpenter. A carpenter understands. You know, they 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 know wood. You know, they without even saying anything, they can look at the grain and tell you which way the board should be flipped on a deck or a porch. You know, you know, it's, it's part of them. It's there. You know, I, I know some mechanics. <laughs> you know, I can change an oil filter. I can't change an engine. <laughs> you know, there's Dan understands old cars. Oh my goodness. He doesn't even think about it. He just, it's him. He, under, he owns it. And there's lots of people who can quote scripture, but they don't understand it. They don't. You, we want, I, I've been telling people, and, and please don't shut off the Facebook Live when you hear this, <laughs> but I, I've been telling people to quit reading the Bible. And, and, and I tell them to start. I tell them to start feeling it. Start experiencing the Bible when you read it. It's more than reading the word. It's under. It's understanding it. It's 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 feeling it. It's it's getting that that word in your heart and let it do something on the inside. What in the world good is it if you read it eight times a year for fifty years and you don't understand any of it? I just read the Bible eight times for fifty. So. If you don't understand it, if you don't own it, you know what I'm saying? If, you, if it doesn't move, if, if, if when you read scripture, it doesn't move you, you haven't done nothing. Scripture was meant to move us. Amen to that. Okay? So, if, you know, if you go to a, a sermon and it doesn't move you, you know, people ask me all the time about giving in, in, well, not all the time recently, but in times past. And I said, because they all hung up on percentages and this and that. I said, listen, if your giving doesn't move you, you haven't given enough. It needs to move you. You need to feel it. You need to be a part of it. It doesn't matter the amount. You know, God wants us to feel Him. And it's, taste and see. Now we're getting into heart physics stuff. Taste and see. There's five senses in our in our flesh. Touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing. Does everybody understand that? Your body, your flesh works on those five senses. Touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing. That those are mirrored in the spirit. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, taste, see, feel. We're supposed to feel it. God wants us, the word is supposed to be experienced, just not read. Okay, and so that's what we're trying to. I, I really want you when you read scripture, I want you to feel it instead of just reading it. Start feeling scripture, and so when it says this in, in verse one, what then shall we say that Abraham, not Moses, our father? Wait a minute, what do you mean our father? See, see how many people know we're grafted in. We're grafted in. You know how many people think we're grafted into Judaism? You know, I went to a Bible school where their whole emphasis of importance was it, uh, maybe not becoming Jew, but being as close to Jew as you could be. You know, we're not called to be Jew. We're not called to be Gentile. We're one new creature in Christ. You know, we're something that has never been on this planet before. And we're going to speak a lot about Judy. But I've always heard that, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm reading this little book. You know, there was a time when I thought that Abraham was the father, because Abraham was the father of the Jews, that, well, if he's my, he's speaking to Gentiles here, telling the Gentiles that Abraham is the father. And I'm thinking of the Jews, and I'm going, wait, Gentiles aren't Jews. And Jews aren't Gentiles. So how can the Jews be, have the same father as the Jews? I mean, how, how can Gentiles have the same father as the Jews? You understand what I'm saying? If Abraham is the father of the Jews, the, the Jewish race, how can Gentiles be our father also? 
spiritual father. What? That spiritual father, but it's not even just a spiritual father. And then God showed, God showed me this. Guess what? The, the script, let me just read this for you. Question. Was yes. A, was Abraham, he was Chaldean, wasn't he? Yes, from the Earl of the Chaldeans. What then shall we say that Abraham, the father, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him, who justifies the what? Ungodly. He doesn't justify the godly, does he? Hmm. Justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. And we talked about this going about talking about David. But what we need to understand, when you look back in the life and times of Abraham, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's not written right. Because Abraham is a person. But before he was Abraham, he was known as Abram. And Abraham, I'm going to be careful, I can hear it already. Here come the phone calls. Abraham did not receive the promise. Abram did. Abram was all Gentile. There were no Jews when Abram was walking the earth. The Jews really didn't start. The promise did, promises didn't start until Isaac. The promise was given to Abram, and then he became Abraham and sealed it with a circumcision covenant. That was the beginning of the Jewish people. So Abraham was a Jew. Abraham was Jew. Abram wasn't. There was a time when, see, there was a time when I wasn't saved. Then there was a time when I was saved. I'm a different person after I'm saved than before I was saved. No, you're not. You look the same. I know. But I'm a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And still not a Jew. And it's still not a Jew. Thank you, Bob. But you understand, there has been a change in me. I am not like, I was unlike God before I got saved. When I got the Spirit of God in me, now my spirit man is like God with the same nature. And I can now become one with Jesus as we, He is the Father, I am in them, and they are in me. In the realm of the Spirit. Does everybody understand that? When, I love to do this, I'm going to do this again, I'm going to do it nice and simple. When was the promise given, excuse me, to who was the promise given to a Gentile or a Jew? Gentile. The promise was given to a Gentile man named Abram. And he believed it. That why, that's why he's the father of our faith. That's why with Moses is Moses is not our father. It's not fa Father Moses. Abraham is the father of our faith. And he received that when he received that, it was accounted to him as righteousness when he was Abram, a Gentile. And then he became. Uh, does, everybody understand, does everybody understand what happened when he became Abraham? Uh, if, if Joy was here, we'd, have, we'd pull down the screen and have, but you've seen it before. Uh, the word Jehovah has, to, in the Hebrew writing, the word Jehovah has uh, certain uh, letters spelled in Hebrew. Two of those letters is, uh, is the fifth letter in their alphabet, and it's the He. It, it, it has the H sound. It represents two things, life and grace. 
and Jehovah. There's the H sound in there. And Abram doesn't have a H sound in it. And to make Abram, when he was changed to Abraham, God took one of the the fives, one of the lives, one of the graces, the H's out of his name and brought it down into Abram. And Abram became Abram. The only change in Abram's name was that he received the age. And God put grace in his life and grace into his life and life into his life. And he became a different person. He went from being Abram to Abraham. That's powerful. And that's why from that point on, he was known as Abraham and not Abram. So when you look back and see that the promises of being justified by faith didn't come to a Jew at the time, it came to a Gentile at the time who became a, the father of the Jewish nation. Because of the ancient word. And then we go on from that, and Sarai is the same thing. Sarai, his wife, right? Her, her name was Sarai, and it became Sarah. Sarah. Well, she didn't have an ancient, she didn't have life. And remember, Abraham was past the time of being able to give life. Sarah was past the time of being, her womb was closed up. She couldn't produce life. Dead in his flesh. And then, yeah, yeah, we won't get into that. Don't go, you know where I'm going. Okay. That's one message you remember. Say right there. I never thought of that before until I heard it. That's good Bible study right there. I'm telling you right there. But anyway, and so her, her, womb, her womb was closed up, and God took the other age that was in his name and brought it down and put it into Sarai, became Sarah. But before this, there's a, there's a letter missing in Sarai. Is spelled with a certain letter in it, and when Sarah is spelled, that letter is no longer in it. So he had to take out a letter before he could put the life and grace into her, so it could bring life to her womb. He had to take out a letter because this five can't be in the same place with this letter. The letter that was taken out was the yod. It's the number ten, and guess what ten represents? How many commandments are there? The law. So God had to take the law out of Sarai's name before he could put the H, life and grace, into her name. Because grace and law can't dwell in the same. And, and that tells us about that in Galatians. If you ever want to read, read Galatians chapter 4. It says this is symbolic. That the, the bond woman was the Jerusalem that now is. It's the law. It's the old covenant. And the old covenant can't dwell in the same vessel as the same house as the new covenant, which is Sarah. Man. That, see, see, for me, there are so many scriptures that separate the old covenant and the new covenant. You know, God says that, that he was going to make a new covenant with his people. Guess what? I got news for you. You're not his people. <laughs> You're his children. You're not a Jew. You're his bride. Uh, it has to be one of his kind, which is his children. They can only join. You're the bride of Christ. You are not a Gentile. There were laws that God gave to the Gentiles before Moses showed up. There were seven laws. There were six laws given to Adam. And Noah added a seventh law. And what was given to the world, say world, world. as a sign that God would never flood the earth again. He made it he, he, he gave a rainbow to Jews. What? To Gentiles? You mean he was speaking to Gentiles? Noah was a preacher of what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Enoch walked with God. You think he knew some things about what God wanted to happen on earth? 
Got a question. The scripture says that the world at that time rebelled against God. How can you rebel against God if there's not something there to rebel against? Makes you think, doesn't it? How did Cain and Abel know to give offerings and what kind of offerings to give? Where did they give them? When did they give them? Ask these questions and you'd be surprised what the Holy Spirit will do to you answer your questions. The answers are there. How many colors in the rainbow? Seven. Who said seven? There's seven colors in the rainbow. The rainbow was given as a testimony of the covenant that he had just made with seven laws. Each color represents one of the seven laws. Can I, can, can I just jump in there? Yeah. I'll just go ahead and say this. The LGBT rainbow is different has colors. Six. Has different colors too. Minus one. What we need to understand too is that that uh, I can't, I just went, that there was laws that were given. There was an understanding. God created man with a conscience. You know, stop and think about it. Cornelius, did we talk about this last week? We did? Okay. Yeah, Cornelius was a what? Gentile. He was a Gentile. And he loved God. He went under the law. But he had a conscience. People know what's right and what's wrong. Why? Because God wrote it on our hearts. Okay? That's why the book of Romans says everybody's without an excuse. Because we all have a conscience. So, let's go on. Since we talked about that last week. Let me go ahead and read the rest of this. Uh, but Verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness we talk the word imputing uh, it's like an account putting something on your account when you sin there was an account of your sin sin came to uh, the law came to impute what? sin so when you, when you broke the law there was a record of it that you sinned against the law. It was imputed to you. You owned it. Before it, there was no nothing to impute the sin. But sin, man sinned from the beginning even. And it goes on and says this, God imputed righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Listen to this. This is King David. This is the guy that, that committed adultery, killed the husband of the woman he had, and, and and he, under, he understands this. Blessed are those, those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. This is by law, the scripture says. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute their sin. It doesn't mean there's not sin, but it's not imputed. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Are upon the what? I'm circumcised. Now, every time you read the word circumcised, do yourself a favor until you get a handle on it. Right above there, over the top of the word circumcised, and put the word Jew. When it says I'm circumcised, do yourself a favor until you get a handle on it and put the word Gentile. You understand? Okay. Does this blessedness then come upon the Jew only, or upon the, uh, or upon the Gentile also, or the circumcised also? For we say that faith had, was accounted to Abraham, and it's really to Abram, for righteousness. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised? are uncircumcised. Now with the instructions I just gave you, let's read it this way. How then was it accounted him while he was a Jew or when he was a Gentile? 
man, doesn't that change it? Yeah. It speaks it really loudly that way. Because the Jews were circumcised. Abraham was the first to get circumcised. So when was this account, when was his faith that counted to Abram or Abraham? Was it when he was circumcised or when he was what? Uncircumcised as a Gentile. What verse he in? Verse 10. 10. 10. It's when he was uncircumcised as a Gentile. Not while circumcised, not while a Jew, but while uncircumcised as a Gentile. And when he received the sign of circumcision as a Gentile, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. He tells you right there. He received it when he was uncircumcised as a Gentile. And then he became. Circumcision was a seal. Uh, again. Uh, verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision. A seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised that he might be the father of all those who believe he's not the father <laughs> Both. he's not can I say this boldly <gasps> sure. mm. In the lineage, genealogy lineage, he is, yes, the father of Jews. But in Scripture, that's not important. You realize that? Mm -hmm. What's important is that he's the father of all those that believe. Mm -hmm. Whether Jew nor Gentile, it doesn't matter. If you believe, I don't believe, see, there, there's other characters in the world mm -hmm. uh, Barbarians were mentioned in scripture. They were just untaught Gentiles. They they didn't they were savages. But if they believe Abraham's their father. Yes, in the line of genealogy, Abraham is the father of the Jew, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and it goes on and on and on and on and get to Jesus and so forth. But he's not the father. Look, look at what it says over here in John chapter 8. Uh, I sure hope this fits. Oh, oh my. Look at John chapter 8. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and a group of people that were with him. In verse, uh, we're going to start verse 28 in John chapter 8. Uh, uh, if you read all of this, you'll go, man, it just. Uh, they talk, they were, he was in the temple right before this. And this is when they brought the woman accused in adultery. And he says, Women, where's your accuser? You know that story? Sure. Well, that's the first part of John chapter 8. So who's he standing around? He's standing around a bunch of Pharisees. Verse 13, look at verse 13. The Pharisees, the Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. And so who's talking to him? Say Pharisees. It doesn't stop. Look down at verse 21. Then Jesus said to them again. See, he's still speaking to the same group of people. Right? Look over at verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, same group of people. When you lift up the when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do the things that please Him. And He spoke these words. Many believed in Him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed, if you abide in my words, or in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? Free. Free. They answered him, talking about the Pharisees now, we are Abraham's descendants. Whose descendants? Abraham. Whose seed? Abraham. Whose lineage? Abraham's. 
and have and have never been in bondage to anyone. Yeah. What a joke! When weren't they in bondage? Mm. Now and then. Mm. Most of their history was always in either to Rome or to Egypt or Babylon. Give me some kind of break. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered, most surely I say to you, whoever committed, goes on talks about this, commit, committing sin, and, and it, it, it actually calls these people that say that, uh, it calls them the, uh, the, the offspring of the devil. Look at verse 38. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our, what? Father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. See, he's identifying, it's not about lineage. I think we read a scripture in Romans uh, two weeks ago that says that there's people that are Gentiles that do what the law says to do, and they're not under the law, but it's just in their heart to do it. And then the people under the law don't do it because it's not in their heart. It's just in their head. Man. So it's not about the lineage of Abraham. It's about the spirit. It, do you have faith? Faith. Abraham, the father of our faith, was Abram when he received the promise. And then he became Abraham. Man, that's powerful. Look back at the book of Romans again. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Well, let's go ahead and read it. Uh, go down to verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith with uh, which he had while still uncircumcised, or still a Gentile, that he might be the father of all who believe, uh, though they are uncircumcised, uh, though they are uncircumcised that righteousness might be imputed to them, who? The uncircumcised also. And the father of circumcision to those who do not only are, did I say that right? And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of faith with our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. This is speaking about when he was Abram. Man, I tell you, how can you? This, this, this will revolution. This will set you free from the law of Moses. This will set you free from trying to, to, for other people to put you being a Jew pressure on you to quit it. We're, we can learn from the Jewish history. We need to learn from the Jewish history. All the feasts, the festivals, it's all good stuff. <coughs> we can learn. But it's not an act of righteousness by any means. Man, I tell you what, it's just so much in here. Verse 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, Faith is made void in the promise of no effect because the law brings about what? Wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Man. Therefore, see, I wanted to get down to this, but we had to read that before we get down to this. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to what? Grace. And what does Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 say? Come on, Peter. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not one or the other. It's both. For by grace you've been saved through faith. So that the promise might be sure to what? All seed. Not only those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. That means Gentiles. Who is the father of us 
all. He wasn't speaking about Jewish people. He was speaking about anybody that believes. And all the people at Rome that he was speaking to had believed in faith righteousness, not law righteousness. Man, I tell you what. One comment? Yes. When you're talking about all this stuff that's written for us, Romans 15, verse 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. Yes. And in 2 Corinthians, it says that, or 1 Corinthians 10, 11. 10, 11, it, said, it says that, that all these things happen for our exhortation to help us walk in life. Not for us to get bondage to. I, I tell you what, how many, we, we talked, again, we talked about those seven laws. There's one law of the Ten Commandments that's not contained in the seven laws. We talked about this last week. I'm doing this for the ones that are on Facebook Live. The Sabbath is not is the only law that was not mentioned in the seven laws that were given to the Gentiles before the law of Moses was given to the Jews. Wow. Don't murder, don't steal. These were all laws given, given to the Gentiles. Anyway, we'll go there. That may shift. Look back at, 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 at verse 8. Let me share this. Verse 7, I'm starting. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Remember what the scripture says. Matter of fact, it says it right over here. Look at verse, um, look at verse 17. We we're just getting there. Verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of what? Many nations. Many what? Nations. Does it say just one? No. Why don't we, Vicki, why don't we see this? Yes, we have blinders on. We have blinders on. He's the father of how many nations? Many. The church thinks he's the father of the Jews only. What's it say? I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they what? As though that is the attitude of faith. Faith is seeing the finished product and looking at something that's not that way and speaking the finished product onto what is not the, the way it's supposed to be. That's what it's talking about. He sees those things that are not as though they are. When God looks at your life, He sees you the way in your complete form. He sees those things that are not as though they are. Now remember, he doesn't account to us. He doesn't account our sin to us. If, now, now, now this, I'm, as Paul says in one a couple of his places in Corinthians, I'm speaking, to you know, I'm speaking to you as a man now, okay? So I'm asking this question, not, I'm, I'm not trying to bring doubt that God couldn't do this, okay? But can God see those things that are not as though they are? Oh, yeah. For sure. No question about it. Then can he see the things that are? Is they uh, they are not? Sure. So you may have sinned, but he's big enough not to be able to see that. If he's big enough to see the things that are not as though they are, He's also big enough to see the things that are as they are not. That's good. You've got to think on that one. You need to take that home and waller on it. That's what we, we call it down. <laughs> the rednecks, we waller on things. We don't meditate. We waller. Okay. You need to waller on that one. If God is big enough to see those things that are not, as though they are. What's it say about sin? They're as far as the east, west. The west. 
And I will remember your sins, what? No more. So why is it so hard for us to understand that if God can see those things that are not as though they are, that he can also see the things that are as though they are not? Because this doesn't, this is the realm of the flesh. He lives in the realm of the spirit. Man, it's powerful. So many Facebook lives are getting set free. I can feel it all the way over here. I mean, that someone needed to hear that. You think God has always kept a track of everything you've done wrong. If he's big enough to see those things that are not as though they are, he's big enough to see the things that are not as and the things that are as though well, they're they're not. And he will remember them no more. Get over yourself. That's powerful. Man, I don't know. I got excited on that one. I guess I'm the only one, but that's all right. Man. As it is written, verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Not just one Jewish nation, people. Man, this is Romans will set you free. In the presence of him who believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed. This is talking about Abraham. Did he have any hope of having children? No. No. What's the scripture say uh, about hope in the Old Covenant? Hope deferred makes the heart what? Sick. You know the scripture? Sick. Don't make it sick. Very good. The scripture says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. That's in the Old Covenant. Don't get your hopes up. It ain't me. Oh, no. Don't get your hopes up. Well, look over here. I'm just going to, I, I got to go to the other column here. Verse 5 in chapter 5. Now hope does not disappoint. So wait a minute. In the old covenant, hope disappoints, makes you sick. Right? In the new covenant, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. What's the very essence of faith? Faith is the substance of things what? Hope, hope for. for. The word hope is a confident, the, in the Greek, Greek word is the confident expectation of good things to come. Man. Hope is the confident expectation of a good thing to come. What is fear? Fear is not the opposite of faith. I don't care how good a faith teacher you are, you misunderstand hope and fear. Because fear is the expectation of a negative to come. Fear is the confident expectation of a negative. Hope is a confident expectation of a good thing to come. It takes the same faith to believe either one of them. Mm -hmm. So if you're always being moved by what you think something's going to happen in your life, you, you got the same faith to believe in the positive things happen in your life. God's Word happened in your life. The promises of God becoming yes and amen in your life. You can believe that. The problem is you've been so trained in, in to think of the negative. You're, we're such a negative minded church. Because we're so used to being what? Disappointed in the natural, but in the spirit. See, hope in the new covenant is spiritual. And I tell you what, that sets some people free. Now, hope does not disappoint. When? Now. Now, hope does not disappoint. Because hope is the very essence of faith. Verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed. So that he might become the father of many nations. How many nations? Many. 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 Just the Jewish nation? No. Many. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Was he talking about, were, were they talking, was this talking about Jewish descendants? No. This is talking about those that believe in faith. Those are the descendants that this is talking about. It's not talking about the Jewish nation. Because he's the father of us all who believe. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. Dan, there's, there's that verse. You understand? 
He did not cons verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. This looks at, and just you can giggle all you want, but this is just the truth. He had grown past the age of being able to get an erection. In his natural way, he could not produce what he needed to produce to have children. Was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God in unbelief. Remember this story? You know the story? I, I fought with the Holy I didn't fight with the Holy Spirit. I didn't wrestle. I don't have a hurt hip. I question I, I, I read this, I, I, I don't remember where, when, what, what else took, but I, I remember reading this go, yeah, he did. He did waver at the promises of God in unbelief. He did. And the Holy Spirit said, read it again. And I read it again. Abraham did not stagger your promise on. And I read, he did. Where did his spell come from? The handmaiden. He did waver. Abraham staggered at the promises of God in unbelief. But this says he didn't. But he did. That's a good argument on my... I thought I had the Holy Ghost on that one. Mm -hmm. That's a little joke. And he said, no. He said, read it again. I'm, he goes, not, not the verse you're reading. Read the story. So I went back to the story and read the story. And the first word I read, revelation came to me. <laughs> It said, Abram. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Abram was the one that staggered at the promise of God. Mm -hmm. Do you know right offhand what, what verse that is? Genesis 15. Genesis 15. Hold on a second. Let me <clears throat> And we're close. Genesis, um, which part? Which part? Where Abram went into Hagar? Yes, see, see. Um, after this, uh, it says, The Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am the shield of your And who did he come to? Ab Abram. And Abram believed the Lord. And counting him as righteousness. It's a uh, look in Genesis 15 16. and 17. 15, 16, 17. Over in 17 is where his name was changed and Hagar, Sarah's name was changed. Now remember, he was Abram when he staggered and went into Hagar. But when he became Abraham, he went into Sarah. There was many years that went in between Hagar and Sarah. His body became dead during those years. He had the male ability to make someone impregnated into Hagar. After that, he lost the ability due to age and could his body was dead and it couldn't be manifested. God had to put the H into Abram to make him Abram Ham, bring life into him, bring life into Sarah. And what we need to understand about the covenant, there is a reason why circumcision was so important. Because, and now we're grown up people, we can handle this. Hopefully on Facebook Live, you can handle this too, but not, you know, deal with it. That when a man is uncircumcised, there's a foreskin that is over the end of his male thing. And the seed, the semen, would go through and come through the flesh into the woman via the flesh. That's why it's called the flesh. And the flesh had to be cut away so the promise wouldn't be of the flesh. 
Do you understand that? Yeah. And that's why circumcision is so important. It's a sign that the promises are not of the flesh. It didn't come through the flesh. It came via the promise. And so it's more than just a circumcision. There's a reason why they were circumcised because it was the promise. It was the guarantee or the sign of faith righteousness. It just wasn't a sign of being a Jew. But anyway, let's go ahead and go on. Question. Yes. Um, how long did that vitality last? That after what? God gave, after God gave that gift back to Abraham, oh. how long did that last? Well, how many more children did he have? <laughs> Six more. Thank you very much. After, after Sarah died, he married again. Because he had the life in him. He still had the ability. God didn't take away the life. Man, that's powerful. Good point, Dan. You knew I'd go right past that. If you could bottle it, we'd make a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't have any purple pills. No. <laughs> he had God. Yes. All right. Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Man. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old. Man. See, this was Abraham. It wasn't Abram. Because now he, Abraham is a hundred years old. His body's dead. He did not waver at the promises of unbelief through... He did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to what? Uh, there we go. He was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. Now is he speaking to? Italians, to Jews that have been saved and Christ in their life. It's all about faith. It shall be imputed to us who what? We believe without works. Believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who was, and I can't help but say this, just not died at Calvary. That's not salvation. Salvation is believing that he that died at Calvary for our sin was resurrected yeah. to bring us life. Yeah. That's our victory. The blood paid the price for our sin, but it goes way beyond that. It came to bring us life. That's the purpose of the resurrection. Who was delivered up because of our offenses. That's why he was delivered up. What? To the cross. And was what? Raised because of our trans justification. He was raised because we're justified. The blood cleansed us. But now that we're justified, we're raised into life. So why do we always... I'm not trying to diminish the cross. I'm trying to magnify the resurrection. We tell people everywhere we go. We say, you know, we, you've been here for nine years, so almost eight, eight some years. <clears throat> that our, our goal is to make Jesus bigger and the resurrection more effective. It's that simple. We want the resurrection. Everybody knows about Calvary. Everybody knows about the blood. Yes, thank you, Jesus. I'm not even thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you, God, for your plan of redemption for all men. But thank you for the resurrection that brings us life and life more abundant. So we can walk on this earth with your spirit men on the inside so we can be more than conquerors all the time. You know, that's life. So we can be a testimony of your goodness. And what a time for us to be a testimony. Can you say amen to that? Amen. 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 Yes. Verse 21, and being fully convinced that he would have had, uh, in what he had promised, he was able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him as righteous for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone 
that it was imputed to him, but also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Does that mean you're already justified? Yes. Who justified you? God did through Jesus Christ. Who sanctified you? God did through Jesus Christ. Are you still being sanctified? Yes. yes. In the realm of your soul and your body. But it's something that God is doing that you give into. You surrender to. If you don't surrender to His sanctification, it's not going to work in you. You just got to know that that's what He wants to do. It says that I'm confident this very thing that He has begun a good work in me. He will perform it. Philippians 1 6. Joy to have it on the board right now. I'm confident this very thing that He has begun a good work in me. He will perform it, including the sanctification. But you have to be willing to surrender to what He's doing in your life and be obedient to that. You just can't go back into your old life and say, well, God sanctified me. No, I don't think so. Because he's saying, how's he sanctifying you? How's it, how do you get sanctified in your soul? Not by what you do. It's by the word implanting in your soul. James, James chapter 1, verse 21. Let me turn it real quick. Everybody, we say it all the time. James chapter 1. Verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness. What? Well, if I'm being sanctified, why do I got to lay aside anything? In other words, can I put this in, in Curtis Coker counseling? Quote, quote, guidelines. Stop it! <laughs> Quit it! Quit that junk that you were doing that made you just like the world. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with what? Meekness. Meekness, the implanted word of God, which is able to save your soul. soul. Your soul is being saved by the word of God that you surrender to. And one of the things we're going to talk about heart physics is that uh, you can't surrender. See, this is a beautiful scripture for this. You can't surrender to God's will or you can't add something to your life that without first setting something aside in your life. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. You're full up. Emotionally, and in the realm of your soul, you're full up. You filled your life with all kinds of stuff. So for you to add anything, you have to, oh, lay aside all filthiness and all things that overflow with wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word of God. If you don't let go of this, you won't receive this. That's right. You can say you want it, but until you lay something aside and make room for it. What's the story about casting out demons out of a person or out of a house? You cast it out. If you don't feel it with the truth, it'll come back. Why? Because you want to be filled with something. You got to be filled, or you're going to be empty. You want to be filled, and if you don't clean the house and fill it full of the truth, what you used to be involved with will come back even worse. Again, another story, another analogy of what it means. You can't bring in the implanted word of God into your soul until you're willing to let something in your soul go. Man, that'll work on somebody. That was James 21, what? Did you James 1, 1, 21. 1, 21. Yeah, there's not a 21 in James 1, 21. And it goes on. It tells you what the Word of God is. It's not the Bible. It's the perfect law of liberty. When that gets in. See, what are you supposed to be filling your soul with? The law of liberty. You can't find that in the Old Covenant, can you? Where do you find the law of liberty? New Covenant. Man. Hmm. 
Let me read this one verse. And what's that mean? Absolutely not. Galatians chapter 5. Actually, two verses. Stand fast, therefore, in the what? Liberty. This is so important. See, the things that we don't know in America, there was actually a, let me just read this, sorry. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you what? What we don't know and what you're going to know is that during the time of the first century church, the early church, there were several heresies that were going around that the church had to combat all the time. There was a group of people called the party of the circumcision. That's what they were called. You can look this up in church history. They were teaching that it didn't matter if you believed in Jesus or not, you had to be circumcised. That's why the Apostle Paul was always addressing the issue of circumcision because there was a doctrine, a group of people that believed you had to be circumcised. This is the beginning of the Gnostic. You heard the Gnostics? Yeah. There's actually Gnostic Gospels. These are heresies. There was another movement that was going around called the Hebrew Roots Movement. That's affected the church a whole lot in our world, in our time. Going back to Hebrew Roots, think it's all about the Hebrew Roots. I'm trying to get you to go way past the Hebrew Roots and go all the way back to Abraham. Abraham. And I'm actually trying to get you to go way back. I actually, forget all that. I don't want you to go back to Abraham. I don't want you to go back to Moses. I, don't, I want you to understand you're one new creature in Christ. You're neither Jew nor Gentile. Don't take pride. I'm only under seven laws. I'm not under ten. Well, you're not under seven laws either. You're a new creature in Christ. You're supposed, your whole heart's supposed to be about your husband, Jesus. Is your whole heart about Jesus? Oops, we won't go there. The very thing that Eve came to do was to be about Adam. Are we in love with what Jesus is in love with? Ooh. Are we helping our husband? Hopefully we're not being a Pharisee. Hopefully we're not being selfish and only thinking of ourselves. Hopefully we're helping those that can't help themselves. Hopefully you're able to walk up to a person that you know personally and they're having trouble and you see them in sin and say, listen, dude, you need to stop that. When's the last time anybody arrested sin in someone's life? Hmm. I heard a pastor tell me, well, well we're just showing them grace. What? Grace empowers someone to overcome sin. It doesn't keep them in it. A total misunderstanding of what grace is. Grace doesn't cover a multitude of sin. You can't show me in the Bible where it says that. It says love does. Yes. Love covers. Love people that are in sin. Don't let it affect your relationship. See? Don't let their lifestyle keep you from being a friend of them. But be enough friend that you can say, here's some grace. Get out of that. Come here. Let me help you. Love them enough to get them out of what they're in through the grace of God. Stand fast in what? The liberty in which Christ has made us free. And what does the book, book of Ephesians say about your, your armor, your spiritual armor? Stand. He says, when you've done all you can do, stand. So when you've done doing all of your, what you can't overcome, in the flesh.
So when you get tired of doing what you can do, stand. And what are you standing in? Grace. Now stand in grace. Let the ability of God work through you to overcome your problem. Man. We even make the armor of God works orientated. you got to put it on. Helmet. you got to pull out the sword. I actually, when I was younger, I heard it taught that every morning you need to put the helmet on, get out of bed, put the shoes on. But I never took it off when I went to bed. They didn't tell me. When you go to bed, take off the helmet, put your sword up, put your shoes on the bed. Get it. We missed the whole thing. Stand. When you know all you can do, stand. What are you standing in? Grace. Standing God's ability into it now. Now you can overcome because you got His ability. Jesus said it was His power working in. The Apostle Paul said it was Jesus' and God's power working through Him. He did more because of the grace of God, not less. Man, there's so many people misunderstand. The Bible even says that there's a true grace. If there's a true grace, that means there's a Father, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to gather together in this place. Holy Spirit, you truly are the great teacher. I thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us here to open up your word, your wisdom, your logic, your scripture, and have it affect us. May we begin to feel your word. May we begin to make it part of our life and our heart. May it just not be something we do, but something we understand. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at cokerministries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parker's Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed.